In this video, I'm going to show you why there are fewer reactions to learn for organic chemistry than you might think. Anyone who's done A-level chemistry, international baccalaureate chemistry, or started undergraduate chemistry at university has probably felt that dread as they've watched the sheer number of reactions pile up in the organic chemistry part of the course. These are the main aliphatic, or open chains, organic reactions that you'll need to know for A-level chemistry. Don't worry if you're not currently doing A-level chemistry, I'm just using it as an example for this video, and everything I'm going to talk about will apply to anyone who's in their first couple of years of organic chemistry. At first glance, this all looks pretty daunting, especially for someone who hasn't done much synthesis before. You'll need to know what these types of compounds are, all of these reactions, including reactants and conditions, off by heart, and you'll need to be able to use them to come up with a synthetic route from any one type of compound to any other. Bear in mind, you'll also need to know a load of aromatic reactions, including some of the reactions of benzene and some of the reactions of phenol. As someone who personally hates having to sit and memorize things, I definitely worried about having to commit all of this to memory when I first started out. It wasn't until I started teaching chemistry that I noticed that there aren't as many reactions to learn as I once thought. I'm going to give you several examples as to why a load of these reactions are actually the same as each other, even more than you might initially realize. Make sure you stick around to the end of the video because the final example I'm going to show you is the least talked about and it will probably make the most difference once you understand it. Feel free to use the timestamps in the description if you want to skip around the video. Okay, so the first point that I want to get across is that Rather than thinking about having to learn all of the individual reactions of alcohols, haloalkanes, carboxylic acids, and so on, start thinking instead that there are a handful of reactions that can often be applied to many different types of compounds. I want to very quickly get the most obvious example out of the way first to illustrate what I'm talking about, and that's oxidation and reduction. The reaction to go from a primary alcohol to an aldehyde uses the same reagent as the reaction to go from a secondary alcohol to a ketone, and the reaction to go from either a primary alcohol or an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. For all of these reactions, we use the oxidizing agent acidified potassium dichromate. This is because they're all the same reaction, oxidation, which, for simplicity's sake, we can regard as a reaction where we're adding oxygen to the molecule. Similarly, to go from an aldehyde or a ketone back to an alcohol, they both use the same reagent, which is sodium borohydride. This is because they're both the same reaction again, reduction, which can be defined as a reaction where we're removing oxygen from the molecule. Also, these reactions are all a type of reduction known as hydrogenation, which is usually where we're adding hydrogen to a double or triple bond. That's why they all use the same reagents as each other, hydrogen with a nickel catalyst. So, start looking for common reagents for common reactions. These first examples might have been obvious to a lot of you, but I just want to make sure that's all clear to start with. Let's move on to a slightly less obvious example, and that's all the different ways there are to make an ester. There are three ways to make an ester shown here, in the presence of a strong acid catalyst, you could react an alcohol with either a carboxylic acid, an acyl chloride, or an acid anhydride. Why do all of these different types of molecules end up at the same product? The reason is that both acyl chlorides and acid anhydrides are examples of what we call acid derivatives. This just means that their functional groups are based on that of a carboxylic acid. So, in essence, they're effectively the same type of molecule doing the same type of reaction. Let me show you an example of a classic esterification with a reaction between propanol and ethanoic acid. The easiest way to figure out what ester will be made is to think what side product is formed during the reaction. In this case, it's just water, H2O. So where is that H2O coming from? For simplicity's sake, 
if we remove the H from the carboxylic acid and the OH from the alcohol, that will all come off as H2O. And everything that's left behind will snap together to give you the ester, in this case, propyl ethanoate. Bear in mind, this isn't the actual mechanism. It's just an easy way for us to understand what's happening overall. I can take a look at the actual mechanism for esterification in another video if you'd like. Just let me know in the comments. Now, I'm going to do the same reaction, but instead of using ethanoic acid, I'm going to use ethanoyl chloride. This is the exact same molecule, but we've just swapped the OH for a chlorine atom. The same ester will form as before, but instead of H2O coming off, it'll be HCl, which comes from here. Just as before, everything that's left behind will snap together to give propyl ethanoate. It's pretty much the exact same reaction. Now I'll do the reaction for a third time, but this time I'll use ethanoic anhydride. Again, this molecule is the same as ethanoic acid, but it's kind of like two ethanoic acid molecules combined together, having lost an H2O molecule, hence ethanoic anhydride, meaning without water. Just like before, when we react this with propanol, we're going to form propyl ethanoate. So pause the video here and see if you can spot the side product that'll form in this case. It's going to be ethanoic acid. Just as before, everything that's left behind will snap together to give propyl ethanoate. With this particular reaction, the ethanoic acid that's formed as a side product could react with another molecule of propanol to produce yet another molecule of propyl ethanoate. So, these three reactions are pretty much the same thing. Acids or acid derivatives reacting with an alcohol in the presence of a strong acid catalyst to give an ester. The only difference is the side product which is formed each time. Let's get a bit more obscure and take a look at an example from the aromatic reactions. There are several benzene reactions you'll need to learn, but I'm going to show you that, with the exception of the nitration of benzene, which is slightly different, all the other reactions shown here are actually identical. The reason is that all of these reactions involve the electrophilic substitution of a group onto the benzene ring using a halogen carrier, usually aluminium trichloride or aluminium tribromide. And these reactions all work in the exact same way. Let's look at the chlorination of benzene as an example. I'm not going to go too much into the mechanism for electrophilic substitution in this video, but suffice it to say, the reaction requires an electrophile, or an electron pair acceptor. All you need to know about the halogen carrier is that its role is to take a halide ion from whatever molecule it's reacting with. In the case of Cl2, it takes a negatively charged chloride ion to leave behind a positively charged chlorine ion. This is our electrophile, which can substitute for a hydrogen on the benzene ring to produce chlorobenzene. Now, all of the other reactions involving a halogen carrier shown here work in the exact same way. Reacting the halogen carrier with chloromethane instead of Cl2 still results in the halogen carrier taking a chloride ion from the molecule it's reacting with, but this time, it leaves behind a carbocation, or a positively charged carbon atom. Just like before, this will be our electrophile, which can substitute for a hydrogen on the benzene ring to produce, in this case, methylbenzene, also known as toluene. It works the same way if we react our halogen carrier with an acyl chloride, like ethanoyl chloride. The halogen carrier takes a chloride ion and leaves behind this carbocation which can substitute for a hydrogen on the benzene ring to produce phenylethanone. All you need to remember for these reactions is that the halogen carrier removes a halide ion from whatever molecule it's reacting with, and the rest is left as a positively charged electrophile, which can then substitute onto the benzene ring. It's all the same reaction. Also, whilst we're here, if we look up at the top of the benzene reactions, this is just another reduction from a ketone to an alcohol, 
hence why we're using the same reducing agent that we discussed before, sodium borohydride. Now, this final part of the video is the least obvious, but perhaps the most useful. This is something which I find is rarely pointed out at school or even at university. What I want to demonstrate here is that many of the types of molecules you need to know about aren't as different as you might have initially thought. I'm going to show you that all of these nitrogen-based organic compounds are just structural analogues of oxygen-based organic compounds that you're probably much more familiar with already. By structural analogue, I mean that they have structures which are pretty much the same, apart from one component. Let's start with amines. If we look at the structure of ethylamine, can you spot what oxygen-based organic compound it most resembles? It's ethanol. Amines are just nitrogen-based alcohols. The only difference is that oxygen tends to make two bonds, so it only has enough bonds to make a single bond to the carbon and a single bond to the hydrogen, but nitrogen tends to make three bonds, so it can make an extra bond with a second hydrogen atom. How about nitriles? If we take a look at the structure of ethane nitrile, can you spot what oxygen-based organic compound it most closely resembles? It's ethanol. Nitriles are just nitrogen-based aldehydes. Again, the only difference is that oxygen makes two bonds and nitrogen makes three. In fact, listen to the name, nitrile. It's just a nitrogen carbonyl. And look, if we return to the reaction summary, we can see that to go from a nitrile to an amine, we need to use a reducing agent, which is exactly the same as when we go from an aldehyde back to an alcohol. It's the same thing because they're pretty much the same molecules. There's just an oxygen version and a nitrogen version. Here's ethane nitrile being reduced to ethylamine, and here's ethanol being reduced to ethanol. Can you see how similar it is? We can do the same with primary and secondary amides. You might be starting to spot the similarities for yourself now. If we look at ethanamide, also known as acetamide, what is the oxygen-based organic compound that this most closely resembles? Pause the video if you want to figure it out. It's ethanoic acid. Primary amides are just nitrogen-based carboxylic acids. And just like how you can make a carboxylic acid by reacting an acyl chloride with water, you can make a primary amide by reacting an acyl chloride with ammonia, which I just want to point out is the nitrogen analogue of water. It's the exact same reaction. There's just an oxygen version and a nitrogen version. How about secondary amides? Let's take a look at N-methylethanamide, also known as N-methylacetamide. What's the oxygen version of this compound? Pause again if you want to figure it out. It's methyl ethanoate. So, secondary amides are just nitrogen-based esters. And look, just like how you can react an acyl chloride with an alcohol to make an ester, you can react an acyl chloride with an amine to make a secondary amide they're all the same reactions. It's just nitrogen instead of oxygen. By the way, all of this also applies to polymerization. To quickly recap, if we wanted to make a regular ester, we can react an alcohol with a carboxylic acid. But to make a polyester, we need to react a diol with a dicarboxylic acid. To demonstrate how this works, if we react a single diol molecule, with a single dicarboxylic acid molecule, we'll get this product, which still has functional groups sticking out of each end. This allows more monomers to keep adding on until eventually a polymer forms, which we can represent like this. Similarly, to make a polyamide, which remember will be the nitrogen version of a polyester, we need to react a diamine with a dicarboxylic acid, which does the exact same thing. So, 
If there's an oxygen version, there's a nitrogen version. And it doesn't stop there. I haven't even mentioned sulfur-based chemistry. If you'd like, I can go into that more in another video. Just let me know in the comments. But for now, if you check it out for yourself, you'll spot a lot more similarities. To summarize, maybe there aren't as many reactions to learn for this level of organic chemistry as you might have originally thought. There is a relatively small handful of similar reactions for similar molecules used over and over. Understanding how so many organic reactions are analogous to each other should help you to combine loads of reactions together in your head, leaving you with a lot less to learn. Once you start to spot these similarities, everything becomes a lot easier. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe for more and let me know in the comments if you have any questions.